Hi, this is To The Right House, a new podcast series by the Global Campus of Human Rights. From skepticism to hope, from utopia to empathy, we discuss human rights, riding waves, but also signaling where the light is. This podcast was recorded in Venice, Italy, on the island of Lido, at the Global Campus headquarters. to the Right House, produced by the Global Campus of Human Rights. I'm Graham Finley, and I'm one of the hosts of our third series, Reimagining Politics Through Human Rights. In this episode, I'm joined by Anya Mir, a political scientist who studies international human rights law and transitology, academic supervisor of the Master of Arts in Human Rights and Sustainability in Central Asia, and founder and program director of the Center on Governance Through Human Rights at the Berlin Governance Platform. Welcome, Anya, and thanks for being with us. We couldn't ask for a better guest to talk about reimagining governance through human rights. Thank you for having me. So you have a very, very interesting recent book on global governance, and you've argued in favor of global governance. Can you describe what that looks like? What role do human rights play in the form of in that form of self government? Well, the global is obviously two, uh, composed of two terms, the global and the local. It started already in the 1980s, coming from uh, economy and the globalization uh, movement. But very soon in the 1990s, uh, by an early writing in 1992 by uh, Robert Robertson, um, it became clear that local, local governance, and therefore also governing through human rights, means a bottom-up approach. Basically, that local initiative uh, that we know as non-governmental organizations, civil societies, but also individuals and human rights defenders determine global norms. So in a nutshell, it local governance, and later I will talk about what global governance means for human rights realization. Global Local governance means that we have global norms, such as human rights norms and standards, the human rights regime, the international, the global one, and local activism initiatives, local implementation. And everybody who hears local will immediately realize there is a lot of global and there is a lot of local, but there is no nation state in this concept. And basically, local is a response to, let's say, an eroding statehood. Within Europe or North America, Australia, New Zealand, you probably would not notice the eroding state because the nation states, the state works more or less uh, stable. But in the rest of the world, and we know it since two, uh, 2024, that we have more authoritarian and autocratic uh, states on the planet, which are an, is an indication for dysfunctional state. The majority of people in the world do not live in stable, let alone rule of law abiding or democratic countries. And in these countries, in particular, the local is super important because people cannot trust states or state institutions. And here we come to, in terms of human rights, the duty bearer. It's not there. It's not the state, the, there is no rule of law, there is no independent judiciary, there is no government, there is no uh, independent human rights commissioner in all these countries who could protect or promote human rights for people. So people on the local level directly uh, adhere to global norms and we have particularly seen that during the COVID pandemic where the right to health and what it implies on the day-to-day uh, -day life was very important to people on the local level who had no other institutions to turn to except for global or international ones. Now, that's very, very helpful. And, and I already have a sort of vision of the kind of participation you're looking for, uh, and it includes human rights defenders, but also whole communities. And I think it's going to probably vary from, from we'll say country, right, or state right now, because those are the geographical areas we have. But I, it's very interesting to shift our attention to these um, local communities. Uh, I mean, all of these uh, communities are different, but at the same time, they might face global threats, right? So how can we safeguard democracy, maybe particularly of your sort, freedom and human rights from these threats? And, and what do you think those threats are? 
Well, apart from the uh, so-called global universal threats, as some would call them, the climate change, the artificial intelligence, the global mobility and migration, um, what one thing these these sort of ex I call them external threats, even so they are man-made, of course. Um, but these external threats, even there, we we realize that one state alone, even the strongest, the most stable ones, will not fix it. Nobody can sort of tame the impact of artificial intelligence alone, even if some countries like China still believe they can by controlling, by censorship, for example. Um, so this is one trigger that basically uh, states um, realize that they have to collaborate more, that they have to work more together on a global level. As we have seen, for instance, again, the European Union here is, of course, an, an example, but also the United Nations, just taking the uh, recent EU Digital Service Act that is literally copied uh, by dozens of states outside the European Union. You know, when you go to Southeast Asia, etc., other states were incapable of creating these sort of international global norms to protect right of privacy, um, the right to information, etc., customer rights copy from other, let's say, international, supranational, global regimes, their normative, legal and political standards and implement them because these states are incapable of doing it themselves. And what this implies um, is, is, is pretty traumatic because people on, the, on this planet, they are not stupid. They realize that their states their governments in particular, are no longer solving the problems. The the big uh, sort of the, the big the external threats, as I call them, is the same we can say about the climate change regime, the COP, the UNF, uh, uh, the, uh the Kyoto Protocol was a global normative uh, framework that resolved local climate change induced uh, problems, migration, et cetera, et cetera, problems. So we are talking here about uh, dysfunctional states and how they get almost in a, in, a, in, a, in a dramatic way further eroded through these uh, global norms because people no longer abide to governmental degrees, laws, restrictions. They're trying to bypass them. And what it means we have seen currently all around the world, of course, that there's a lot of local and national conflicts because governments retaliate. But these governments are dysfunctional and often authoritarian, non-democratic uh, countries. Um, and if, since we're talking about what uh, what uh, this has, uh, the local governance as a little, sort of a third way of governing uh, between um, functioning democratic states, which are an absolute minority on this planet. I mean, we should be realistic. If we have 20, 25 states on the planet who are consolidated democracy, I'm quite positive here then, or maybe optimistic. The rest of uh, the states, we still have another 150, 60 states, are dysfunctional to some extent, even the so-called parliamentarian democracies among them. So in these, um, so we have what some would call a, a global, yeah, not even a crisis, but sort of a global dysfunctionality, even of representative parliamentarian democracies to some extent. And of course, what we would call the authoritarian dysfunctional, extremely dysfunctional systems. These can be mafia states, so-called mafia states, basically de facto run by organized crime, or states, uh, as we've seen uh, also on the Eurasian continent, but in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, who live mainly of remittances. So governments have no longer control over the economy, one-party systems, etc. What is interesting in these sort of um, countries that even call themselves democratic, they hold elections, they even um, become members of international human rights regimes and the various committees and the UN Human Rights Council, et cetera, et cetera. Even in the European context, they are members of the Council of Europe, they occur, they come to the meetings. But, the, uh, but what is interesting also from sort of an, from a political assessment point of view is who governs in these countries, not only de jure, but also de facto, 
And what we recently noticed in the last 10 years with this debate about backsliding of democracy, that many of these so-called dysfunctional um, systems in countries, they are not only uh, no longer, governments no longer control, shape, govern de facto, but also they have established bodies next to parliaments and governments de jure in the constitution. Uh, we have seen this in Russia with the Security Council. We have seen this in, in larger Asian uh, uh, contexts and many countries uh, call up on so-called traditional councils, councils of elders, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who are not elected, who are not le um, uh, legitimized in a way, and they're de facto and de government in this system. So when it comes there to democracies, the democracies are eroding themselves from within. But here comes again cloakal in it. People realize and they say, look, we have we, these, these de jure de facto uh, governance systems, which we call dysfunctional, no longer resolve the problems. And, and therefore, we go one level uh, above and look globally. And thanks to uh, the Internet, that is often possible. Were it how in other countries this is resolved. We have seen over the last two or almost three decades now the dramatic rise of international organizations, of international aid organizations who replace, and here comes the public sector in these countries, the health and education sectors. In some countries, we have 70, 80 percent of the public sectors, which is the core duty of a government to be completely held alive by international donor organizations, aid organizations, you name it. Health and education are the most prominent. And of course, people therefore say, look, I know that this international organization helps me or you know, provides education for my children, but the government doesn't. So these dysfunctional uh, governments, uh, they erode, they collapse. And uh, therefore we have something um, uh, it's also called liquid democracy, and there are many other terms for it. But uh, the question is, yes, we see the eroding statehood. We see that people, uh, local people initiatives uh, adhere to uh, global standards to fix their local problems. But we don't really know how this system, the global governance system, should be sort of in a way democratic in the future and legitimized. But there are some ways uh, that, uh, that some ideas to do it. I think that's a very interesting perspective because in the development space, this sort of predominance of international organizations and even maybe donor or organizations uh, providing basic public services is usually seen as a very bad thing. You know, it's um, it's a sign of the we, we don't talk about failed states, but the failure of the state, as you say. And but it's also seen in terms of a notion of dependence uh, on on um development aid, which is something we want to encourage states to rise above, right, become to develop, become completely independent. And, and it hadn't struck me until you just said that, how much of an investment in the idea of the Westphalian state as, as the goal, you know, uh, still remains in our, even our most benign development discourse. Um, so that is a very, very different take. Do you think that that is sustainable on the long term and, and will it vary from from state to state? Well, personally, I believe that the, uh, since you talked about the Westphalian state, the idea of a nation state, you know, and also creating therefore peace and stability, uh, we, we all understand the idea and, and it made sense for a couple centuries also knowing where, where we came from. However, today, I don't think there is a future for the nation state last even for simply a state as such, um, because of this global mobility and the exchange and the identity politics, which we cannot go here into detail, but I think uh, Francis Fukuyama already alluded us uh, to us a couple of years ago with his book. I, and the, also the future conflicts are about identity conflicts. And um, I'm always impressed by him, how right he was when he predicted something like that. But apart from that, uh, so the state, um, uh, particularly the nation state, I don't believe it has a future. It already de facto does no longer exist, except, again, if you stay in the European context, you find fudging nation states. 
but it costs them a lot of efforts and a lot of debts to remain a nation state. So we're not going into that in, in detail, but more what is happening um, in the rest of the world where this nation state is uh, that governments have already given up to even hold the idea of a nation state and a nation's. And uh, they turn de facto into, well, the, the, the term would be organized crime states or run by uh by uh by shadow governments deep states and so on there are all this sort of terminology but we have to face the fact the governments even the elected governments are no longer in 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 charge and uh, and here i want to uh since you were again um mentioning the western sort of ideal uh let alone not only the uh democratic ideal but also the way of life for many years, and I was one of them, I was defending that, yes, the Western way of life is remains sort of an intriguing benchmark for many, many people around the world, particularly the uh, young people. And I was wondering, what about this so-called Western lifestyle, whatever that is, is the intriguing part? I would, to, uh, today, I would say the lifestyle is, is a, such, it's a too general term. What remains intriguing, what we established, uh, particularly here in Europe over the past decades, is a rule of law and an opportunity biding, let's say, governance uh, concept. And here again, um, the, it is not so much a particular country or a state that is an example for good rule of law and, and equal opportunities for everyone particularly the European Union here, created this concept that this is the ultimate goal. And yes, that is intriguing for many, many people around the world. And it is a benchmark for people. We see this currently in the Ukrainian war. When you ask the people why they want to join the European Union, the first top answer is rule of law and opportunities, equal opportunities, chances, possibilities. Nobody is naive enough to believe that there everything is immediately equal and everybody uh, and justice uh, is coming about. But they know there is something uh, or why the rule of law is always mentioned and the opportunities, which are also core concepts of, of international human rights um, conventions and, and norms and standards. Why rule of law and opportunities is always mentioned is because these people see that their states are not providing it. And again, we're talking about uh, uh, sort of 9 to 10 billion people on the planet, of which uh, 9 billion do not have exactly that rule of law and opportunities, but they all wish the same. And here comes the local governance in again, that uh, what I mean uh, before, that people long, of course, I can't generalize for 9 p um, billion people, but you can see this sen sense of dissatisfaction with uh, national governments, um, but the wishes of the people remain the same. That I think is a very, very interesting perspective. And I, in a way, I'm going back a little bit, but in a way, the, the idea of Ukrainian uh, refugees and, and the, the war in Ukraine and, and then the general uh, issues surrounding global mobility, which as you say, are providing sort of identity crises for for even the wealthiest Western states, um, it raises the question of territory, which also is associated with the Westphalian state, but also the role that these states like the European Union, regional organizations like the European Union, in a way, diffusing or transcending the old territorial arrangements. You know, I'm I live in Ireland. Uh, we are not in Schengen, but you know, Schengen has really reduced the the territorial uh importance of, of of european boundaries in ways which i think we are seeing increasingly um not replicated but you know inspiring regional organizations around the world it's it's uh it's very intriguing that uh, exactly that that region in the world and the european union member states as a, as a region the most stable sort of states that we can still find on the planet were the ones who started the erosion of the nation state, the Westphalian uh, concept, sort of in legal terms, by creating a supranational and here, yeah, of course, institutions such as the European Union, which uh, still is the only one in, in a pretty unique concept. And of course, when you have a supranational institution, the nation states have to give up uh, power, it goes without saying. 
Um, but uh, but whereas here in the European Union, this is sort of organized and in sequences and it's still negotiated two steps ahead, one step back, and we all know the, the speed and the pace of it. Uh, in other parts of our, um, the world, this goes way, mostly uncontrolled. And uh, because also autocrats often do not have a, have de facto the control over their territories, they can only govern through through threats and fears and terror, and therefore need the alliances of what I would call the organized uh, criminals. Um, they are called different ways in, in in different countries, but the clans, the the groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, but in the essence, what we see in these countries is a rapid uh, dissolvement of nation states. They might still be called so in some sort of state, but it's it's a sort of a hollow, uh, empty nutshell, if you want to say these uh, territorial borders. And uh, but de facto, and this is always the intriguing question for every political scientist, not de jure, but de facto, who governs? Where do people go to when they seek uh, solutions? And what we've seen over the past decades, and again, COVID was in a, a sad way, a laboratory of observation for political scientists, because when people had uh, um, issues, not only health issues, but also, you know, how to how to uh, get food and water and, and you know, all sorts of uh, public services, where did they go to? They went to local entities, sometimes religious entities, or the clan leader, or even uh, sort of the organized uh, criminals, etc. And at the same time, they often addressed international, in this case, the WHO, the World Health Organization, agencies for help. So they didn't even dare to go to the national uh, the, the health institutions because often um, they uh, they they didn't get an answer. And I always recall the story of the uh, uh, the situation in the country where I spent most of the uh, COVID time in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia, which is de facto and uh, it's an authoritarian now an autocratic state. And where the Minister of Health, two weeks after the global pandemic was called out, uh, went on a health street uh, to Germany. He left the country. And this is not an exception. And he didn't return for quite a while. So he left the country which was uh, in lockdown during the pandemic completely on its own. And the people helped themselves. And... Uh, and that trust, if there was any trust left already in state institution, that was completely lost and was never regained afterwards. And this is just one of many, many countries. And still people, of course, they go uh, to their uh, local and national authorities for issues that they need, whether it's passport, ID cards, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we should not be fooled. This is not, uh, this is not the core duty of uh nation state let's uh, let's uh, let let alone territorial sovereignty and it's completely hollow what we see well, i think that's really helpful for us to reconceive some of the things we are interested in talking to you about and i, I want to go back to maybe the politics of this because obviously the politics of a situation like that is going to be very different than um, the way we might think of politics in Ireland or in, in, in Western Europe or something like that. And, and I, I think you're going to um, you're able to help us reimagine what that politics looks like. Um, and I'm, I want to ask about uh, young democracies, as we like to call things, which is also usually a lot, a lot of wishful thinking in some cases, a bit like developing countries. But uh, you know, what do you think, uh, how can we reimagine politics when we take our gaze away from wealthy Western states and look at all the countries where democracy is sort of either recently established or under threat or perhaps has not really ever been de facto the way of governing oneself? Um, and where does the politics happen in, in, in that, that kind of state? Where should it happen? Yeah. Um, is it most... Let's see, the, the biggest uh, transition period from autocracies to democracies, global transition period, we had in 1990, from 1990 approximately to 1993, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. By the way, worldwide, many of the proxy states, of course, that were trapped in the midst of the Cold War between the two uh, systems, 
and they also um put, you know went on the pathway to democracy or not so already 10 years later roughly around the 2000s we could see which of the many countries who were the very young democracies at that time almost half of Eurasia, including not only the post-Soviet countries, the Eastern European countries, but also Turkey, for instance, was one of the countries. We saw the same reforms in many sub-Saharan African countries, let alone the Latin American countries who started already in the 1980s. So we had half of the countries that we count today uh, starting off as so-called young democracies. And around 2000, uh, we could already um, see which ones would probably make it to a consolidated democracy. And I can say, and probably not a surprise, that out of the, let's say, 50, 60 countries we probably count at that time, only 10 or 15 would really make it to a consolidated countries. And so I will not talk about them. Uh, we can talk about what they did right and learn from that. But what did the many others didn't do to fail or what we already uh, say a backslide? And one of the sort of obvious uh, that every observer can see the obvious element is Often in uh, the transition processes of these young democracies were halfway through. A lot of the previous regimes, elites, stayed in power. And also what I said earlier, what we can observe in many of these countries who are today back into aut autocracies and only have a history of 30 years. They are very young countries. And they're back in full-fledged autocracies, including countries like Russia, with everybody knows, but also Azerbaijan would be an interesting case to look at. Um, and uh, when we look at that, we could see that the uh, that the reforms that were necessary, let alone let go, or what we call transitional justice, you know, bringing sort of those responsible or perpetrators for the past crimes uh, to light and to justice, did not take place in these countries. This is a very, very obvious pattern in all the authoritarian states young authoritarian states, sort of young democracies, two young authoritarian states that we can see today. And all of them, none of them has thoroughly dealt with the past. Or now comes the second element, what uh, we also see, the second pattern in these countries, that they keep traditional, what I said uh, earlier, de jure bodies alive. For instance, in the post-Soviet space, we find many of these autocratic regimes today, they remained one institution, they kept one institution from the Soviet Union times alive, that is what they call the Security Council. It's a de facto and de jure body, decision-making body within the government that is not elected, that is not authorized. And it has a lot of power. In uh, what we call the Islamic Republic of Iran or, or other various sort of traditional um, uh, countries, you often have religious bodies assigned, not elected. Uh, we see the same in in, uh, in Southeast Asia in some of the countries. And then, of course, we have China there who have many de jure bodies who are not, uh, not even through their sort of um, um, sort of fake uh, democratic um, procedures that they have uh, been put in place. So uh, this is these are two patterns: the lack of, let's say, transitional justice with the path to rupture with the past regime, plus having de jure uh, non-legitimized uh, governing bodies aside. And this is what these young democracies have not done. Now comes their explanation. When you ask them, and now I generalize, of course, it might be different for a country uh, in Sub-Sahara, Africa, or in South America than in, in, in Central Asia. But one thing they have, uh, they have for justification, they say, look, we couldn't bring, uh, we couldn't clean, or we couldn't uh, do the vetting and the illustration process as thoroughly because we didn't have the money and we have to keep some of the former uh, communist leaders alive. Please understand this. We couldn't do it because we were not wealthy enough. Yes, but other countries weren't wealthy enough either and they could do it. Okay, first example. And then the uh, second example that is often brought by these countries as a justification for the de jure extra bodies is that they say, well, these are our tradition. All countries who go through a transition process to democracy, 
keep sort of traditional values, traditional bodies, traditional whatever council of elders alive. Yes, that is true, but not de jure, yeah? not uh, in, in the function. There's one thing, whether you have sort of a, an informal advisory body that you can uh, tap on, etc., or whether you have de jure, uh, a governing body aside next to the parliament and to the governments who takes decision for the country. So this is the two patterns that we can see or the two elements in, in all these young democracies, what they did uh, generally wrong. And then you can, of course, go into details and you find many, many more elements. So we're not lacking of knowledge and understanding why young democracies have a problem. But in a way, I think sometimes these states who have now massively, dramatically backslided to authoritarian uh, regimes, there might be even an opportunity for all of us in this big talks about new global orders and the fight between democracies, autocracies, whatever you want to call it, or human rights versus traditional uh, values, whatever traditional values are, is that the uh, people um, in these countries, they are not only mobile because of the travel opportunity, opportunities, uh, but they are also mobile in terms of knowledge transfer. And I'm always impressed traveling to these uh, countries and half of my life I've worked in authoritarian countries and autocratic countries, the understanding and the knowledge they have and when uh, of democracies of a different sort of um, governing um, uh, regime. And here again, that's why I'm so confident uh, that these people, when it comes up to rule of law and opportunities, really share the same, let's say, values or wishes that people do in, in democracies. And the, the, the other observation is, yes, they might be often very frustrated and do not have the energy to oppose their countries, are threatened, are intimidated, and you name it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they are happy with their autocratic countries. I have not seen that. Huh? Um, but yeah, okay, I'll leave this there for <laughs> for the moment. Yeah. No, that's very helpful because at the next, we've talked so much about authoritarian states and, and I, I do, I still want to hear more about, about how this is uh, supposed to work in in the authoritarian states, which, as you say, are increasingly not just more common, but are even sort of proud of their authoritarianism uh, to the point of, of 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 really quite overtly moving away from democratic uh, forms and norms. Uh, so I just want to ask a little bit more about the the politics and new ideas of politics in that space, because um, I was really struck by how you were just talking about the sort of communities of affinity and forms of solidarity or fellow feeling, which are across, uh, again, the globe. You I mean, they're, they're really, no, they're not just international, they're, they're global in the sense that people through the internet and through just the spread of information through so many ways, and even culture can feel affinities with people in places they, they have never been and, 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 and they might not ever get a chance to go to. Um, how does that work as a politics? In, in these authoritarian states, um, does it rise to the level of challenging these authoritarian forms, or is it is it simply a sort of dissatisfaction, which very often leads people to vote with their feet by by trying to leave these these authoritarian states? Uh, that's a very good point. Um, I think uh, it, of course, it depends again from state to state, but there's an interesting observation that uh, in in many of these authoritarian countries, when I ask particular colleagues, local colleagues who are from the countries, but who, are, who have traveled the world and can compare. And then they say, look, um, we have an autocratic government, XY, whatever autocratic government, or a mafia state. And they're a small elite. And yes, they abuse they, um, uh, the country, they uh, suck geld, uh, the money out of the country and, 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 and abuse it in, in a way, the resources and everything. We all know that. But as long as they leave us, the other 90, 80% of the population alone, we can survive in this interesting statehood, I call it now, where you have these very small elite doing what they want, 
but there there is a limit there's a concept like a social contract between the societies and that's often in these societies or in these countries which uh work uh they the people don't pay taxes because they don't have a functioning tax regime they live off remittances etc and this is part of the social contract we let you live in this territory of your ancestors you live here for hundreds and hundreds of years with your family you arrange yourself in a way we don't touch you but you do not oppose us and that is also why we see often in these countries um uh, local conflicts being often so violated because that is under the under the uh lots of the 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 orbit and uh, below the control of the governments and uh, here comes the global in it what we've seen that many of these local conflicts among small groups of communities whether it's ethnic or religious or economic yeah for economic reasons uh most of the conflict uh, conflicts are actually economic and not as uh, ethnic or religious um and they uh, the government often is completely absent or comes in weeks later and why is that because of this social contract it is an unwritten social contract and for me it was a very interesting observation in these countries that many of them told me this so they resolve it locally let's say and often here we see uh this what i described at the beginning about local governance where many of the local leaders they say well i'm not calling the uh, minister of internal affairs or the police or the military of the government i'm going to let's say the international uh normative framework let's look at the website of the high commissioner for human rights in geneva what they do about uh uh rule of law compliance or resolving minority issues and or uh, issues with uh, people with disability women rights child abuse child labor etc or where do they get their ideas from to resolve local conflicts by themselves and that is particular in countries again asia is a, is a very interesting um, um place to to observe because you have a very limited sort of local civil society and local local actors the challenge here is of course how democratic are these uh um and uh, local leaders or local initiatives but i wouldn't underestimate that there is some sort of form of um um democratic um or uh, ways of electing appointing these people um and mostly known of course by the multi stakeholder approach and you know, that you bring in different stakeholders uh to 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 into councils for instance to resolve local issues um we do not have the time here but uh, there is a plethora of examples of local or some call it local peace building and here comes another element in it it's not only that local groups without any governmental intervention resolve their problems they often get help if they get help from international organizations huh? to a resource as monitoring groups we see the same now in the Israel Gaza conflict also the role of international uh, um, organizations uh, playing in there for resolving on the local level the, the most uh, severe human rights abuses and and dealing with that so um and that is globally an observation interesting enough i think that these national governments who do not interfere with 80% of their population and let them basically alone um that they still think that they can remain in power for an indefinite time uh by not caring about let's say the public sectors public security public health public education for their people and they leave it completely to local out, uh, authorities and international organization that is sometimes astonishing to me uh but maybe they know something that i don't know <laughs> well um i have to get this question in although we we've, we've talked in such a sophisticated way but you are director of a center for governance through human rights and i just very quickly if you could tell us the difference between a politics and human rights or a politics of human rights and politics through human rights well politics uh of human rights is basically the duty bearer and the right holder uh, issue that we've all grew up with with the idea of 
a functioning uh, state authorities or authorities in general who uh, ex execute certain policies into politics and basically doing something, protecting our rights, uh, making sure that they are, we have access to justice, that we have access to education, access to health. So this is sort of executing policies of human rights that is politics and human rights. And politics and human rights is still our main benchmark. For instance, when we look at the uh, annual reports, whether it's uh, of NGOs or even governments about how they reform in protecting, promoting human rights, classical politics and human rights. Politics to human rights has a different uh, sort of approach and benchmark. It's basically how international human rights norms, and uh, we are quite broad on that, this normative framework, are included in every policy of an entity that could be local and uh, one of the, um, the pioneers of um, um, politics let's say through human rights uh, was uh, were the sanctuary cities uh, in the United States later across the world or for instance I've already back into the 1990s San Francisco gave the example of saying we are going to uh, uh, ratify the CEDAW Convention, the Convention Against the Discrimination of uh, Women. Um, we don't have to. We're a city. We're not a nation state, but we do it as a commitment. And we want to mainstream women's rights in all our local policies. And that would be sort of politics through human rights or governance through human rights. Uh, not taking, looking at how did you fulfill human rights, but how did, have you mainstreamed it basically, not only in the polity and policies, but also, of course, in the politics. Well, Anya Mir, thank you so much for helping us reimagine governance, but also politics of human rights. And uh, I think we, we look forward to seeing how um, your new form of global governance uh, develops in so many different uh, states around the world. Thank you, thank you for um, having this topic today.